Hey friends, it's Anna McHugh. Quick caveat and prologue to this next video. There are a couple of moments where the mushrooms I am showing off drift a little bit out of frame. Reason for that was I was experimenting with, uh, you know, making a video with my iPhone pointed forward without a viewfinder. So um, I am definitely learning how all of this works and I got some really good detail with that cool triple uh, camera that I have, but at the same time trying to come up with a good viewfinder solution. But in the meantime, I didn't want to trash this video. There's some interesting specimens in it, and I hope you get some value from it. Hey, mushroom fans. It's Anna McHugh. Uh, I want to show you a collection of mushrooms that I've found uh, and use them to highlight and illustrate the different kinds of uh, fertile surfaces you'll find on mushrooms. So if you're just getting started with mushroom hunting, one of the very first things that you'll get familiar with is uh, wherever the mushroom spores come from. So often that's gills. Uh, sometimes that's a porous layer. So we have a massive uh, category of mushrooms called polypores. So they have, a, again, a porous undersurface. We also have mushrooms that have sponges underneath. And so uh, those are sort of the Boletaceae. So uh, Boletaceae is just basically the large classification for mushrooms that have uh, spongy undersurfaces. So here's an example of what that uh, looks like. And then we um, also have a mushroom here that is a parchment fungus. So it is neither polypore nor bolete type. It does not have gills. It is just sort of a smooth undersurfaced little deal. Uh, so again, want to go through a few of those and also the species that I have because these are pretty common uh, late season mushrooms uh, for the southeastern U.S. So I am going to start uh, with Amanita lavendula group. This is a beautiful mushroom that is oftentimes uh, looks a lot like a death cap mushroom to people. Um, and, you know, that is uh, a very common, you know, misidentification. Hence, the common name is the false death cap. Uh, lavendula group is basically defined by being a beautiful cap and stem mushroom. It has uh, this. Uh, gilled undersurface, so that's what I mean when I'm referring to gills. It also has what's called an annulus, and that's a ring on the stem. So observing what's happening underneath in that, that gill surface is really important because that's where the mushroom spores come from. And so, you know, oftentimes the color is decisive for an identification, but whether or not you have an annulus is also a really important factor uh, to consider. So uh, Amanita lavendula has a really nice, uh, you know, partial veil is another way of referring to an annulus. I usually just call them rings on the stem, uh, you know, but that you can call them any of those three things. Uh, so, you know, in addition to that, you have a really distinctive feature for the Amanita genus, and there's a lot of different Amanitas, some of them very dangerous, many of them very beautiful and colorful. Uh, but in the case of, uh, you know, all Amanitas, you have some kind of uh, remnant of tissue at the base. This is called a universal veil remnant, and there's a couple of sub subcategories of what they look like. But essentially, it's some sort of protective tissue that covered the baby mushroom before that mushroom was mature enough to emerge. In the case of Amanita lavendula group, it's kind of a, uh, you know, stumpy, somewhat, uh, you know, sack looking partial veil, or excuse me, universal veil. But what you'll notice is that it's actually uh, attached to the mushroom itself. So you have sort of a roll of tissue. So it looks like a cup, but it is not a cup. It is actually just attached. This is the important feature for distinguishing this mushroom from Amanita phylloides, the death cap mushroom. So, you know, Amanita phylloides is also, uh, you know, a white gilled mushroom that has a ring on the stem. Uh, and it also oftentimes has uh, this sort of, um, you know, yellowy color. Amanita phylloides tends to be a little more green, but we'll talk about cap color in a second. Uh, but, you know, Amanita phylloides, instead of having this attached, uh, you know, piece of, of tissue at the base, the stump at the base, it has an actual cup that you can basically pop the mushroom out and there's a distinct cup here. So that's the really important feature. And, you know, with this uh, Lavendula group, it tends to be a little smaller. It's uh, more round. So, you know, with the cup, you have a little bit more of, um, you know, an elongated oval shape going on. But this is just sort of a stumpy round uh, base. 
this is another really good specimen as far as it being like, okay, it's not very, it's not very large. It's kind of, uh, you know, inconsistent in how it's shaped. Uh, but that is a really important um, way of, you know, figuring out that you have uh, Amanita lavendula group instead of Amanita phylloides. Now, uh, for cap color, you have a pretty uh, light uh, yellowish color and um, a name that is uh, historically applied to this mushroom and is uh, the official name for a European mushroom is Amanita citrina and that is uh, the citrina is in reference to this sort of really pleasing uh, very light lemony color. Lavendula group is pretty cool though because in addition to that you also have uh, oftentimes a sort of slightly uh, you know lavender colored uh, dusting of uh, tissue at the on the top of this smooth cap. And so I remember the name Lavendula group because it is, I mean, it's brownish lavender, but it leaves little spots and streaks on uh, the caps of Amanita Lavendula group. So I uh, remember it that way. And then, um, you know, the additional features you just want to look out for, again, is a cap and stem mushroom that doesn't have a very elaborate stem. A lot of Amanitas have like, uh, you know, scales or, um, you know, really beautiful stripes, that sort of thing. And, and Amanita lavendula group uh, does not. This is not a mushroom I recommend uh, eating. It is considered edible, but I would imagine um, that all but the most advanced mushroom hunters would tell you uh, just to not bother. It being called the false death cap, I think will probably give you enough caution as it is. So I will uh, stop browbeating you about mushroom collecting safety and proceed to uh, these mushrooms. They're uh, edible, but they're not in this current condition edible. They're just completely dried out. Uh, this is Ario boletus betula, also known as the shaggy stalked bolete. And I'm going to show you why, because it has a beautiful pinky red stem. And then it has these uh, yellow interconnected shags. It's basically, uh, it's essentially like, almost looks like little vertical, uh, you know, windows or something. Uh, that open up to, you know, reveal underneath this uh, reddish pinky color. So, uh, you know, Ario boletus betula is a nice edible when it's in better condition. But uh, in addition to just wanting to show it to you and how to identify it, uh, the primary identification feature is that it is a bolete type mushroom. So it has uh, a sponge underneath. So this is so dried out, but I will be able to show you. So instead of having gills like that Amanita lavendula group, we have uh, a sponge. And in this advanced age, you can see that sponge is kind of a greenish olive color. And that is the color of the spores that develop inside the sponge and then they, you know, drop or poof out, what have you. Uh, but when uh, this shaggy stalk bolete is fresh, the uh, color of the sponge is really the, sort of a vibrant yellow. Uh, you have a mushroom that starts out oftentimes a little bit on the, um, you know, golden colored or orangey side. Uh, and as they mature, they tend to turn red. But you have a variation in uh, shaggy stalk boletes that's really from a really, really light yellow color all the way through to uh, this sort of dark burgundy. Uh, this particular specimen doesn't show it. Let me see if this is another collection that I actually think is more attractive and uh, also shows uh, the propensity of this mushroom to have a really big clump of mycelium, white mycelium at the base. So, you know, you have this really glorious, colorful, uh, elaborate mushroom with these shags on the stem and, uh, you know, beautiful caps, but they emerge from this big old butt of uh, white mycelium. So that um, is, is distinct for them amongst all the other uh, bolete mushrooms. And boletes, uh, boletaceae, you have a gazillion of them, lots of different uh, genera. You could, you could go for days, weeks, years, decades, uh, millenniums, perhaps. So uh, anyway, but uh, the, the main thing to highlight about the bolete type mushrooms is that they have, again, this uh, spongy surface. And when you're collecting them to eat, I often will remove the sponge because it's got a very different texture and consistency from uh, the cap. And that's only if I'm eating them fresh. A lot of times I'll take boletes and then, uh, you know, dehydrate them and rehydrate them. And then uh, the sponge is a little less slimy and fussy. But all that by way of saying, I'm not gonna take these home uh, because they're a little elderly. But nonetheless, I mean, 
given their age, I think the nice thing about them is it really highlights that dual color between that orangey yellow shagginess and the, and the reddish underneath. Alrighty, so we've talked about bolitsa, we've talked about uh, our amanitas. Here's another kind of guild mushroom to keep an eye open for. So I just want to highlight this because this is a lactarius mushroom. I'm not sure which one, uh, but you know, a lot of times you're collecting mushrooms from the forest floor and you find a lot of them that are in variable color and condition and you flip them over and they don't have a lot going on. They're just sort of a cap and stem dealy. And when you damage the gills, that's when you get, uh, you know, the information that you actually need to identify the mushroom. So in this case, you can see a beading of uh, white latex, that's what it's called. Uh, and that's how it gets its name, Lactarius, from this lactating behavior. So, you know, if you have a mushroom and you damage it and it starts to, uh, you know, bleed, that is what you have on your hands. So that's one of the reasons it's important to sort of interact with your mushrooms pretty uh, vigorously. You know, taking photographs is great, but also smelling them. This one smells very unpleasant, uh, sort of farinaceous. Tasting them, etc., is oftentimes really important. And certainly, uh, you know, I, I like to get photos before I start taking them apart, but uh, I do take them apart for fun, profit, and knowledge. Okay, not profit, but knowledge for sure. Okay, so that's another kind of um, uh, sort of guild undersurface that you could see on those uh, lactarius mushrooms. I also want to show you a uh, Cortinarius genus. This is really common in cooler weather. Uh, I'm not exactly sure which one it is. There's a lot of them and I'm not very good at them. But uh, Cortinarius is relatively, uh, you know, common again in cooler weather. Oftentimes they favor pine and so, uh, you know, we see a lot of them. They are distinguished by being cap and stem mushrooms that have uh, rusty colored gills when they're mature. And that's often, uh, you know, hard to see when they're much, much younger. But at maturity, the gills uh, take on the color of the spores, which is a, a rusty color. The other thing about Cortinarius is that they have, and I will show you, this is the uh, fine specimen of it. Uh, it's a feature that's called a cortina. So basically what you can see is this little uh, sort of webby, uh, you know, protective layer. I mean, it doesn't provide much protection. I don't actually know what purpose it serves. But, um, you know, again, it's a little cobwebby layer that goes between the uh, stem and then to the margin of the cap all the way, <laughs> all the way around. Yes, interact with your mushrooms uh, as vigorously as you can. So um, anyway, this cortina is what makes uh, a cortinarius distinguishable oftentimes. So if you find a small one, you'll often see them intact. But as they start to age and mature, you can see these mushrooms, they don't have any of the cortina. All you see is a little bit of uh, sort of rusty colored streaking on the stem. And so cortinarius can be a little bit tricky because that cortina is so uh, very uh, delicate that it can just sort of, it, it's very ephemeral. You can, um, you know, it can rain off, but you'll often see a mushroom that's sort of like, and, and Cortinarius comes in all colors, all kinds of sizes. It oftentimes has a sort of lumpy, bumpy, uh, you know, irregular appearance. Like this is a really good example of one. You can see also I've got this rust colored, uh, the rust colored spore deposit very easily comes off on my fingers. But, um, you know, often with that Cortina, all you'll see is a little bit of streaking or lighter coloration above, uh, you know, toward the top of the cap and a little bit below. So uh, Cortinarius is not recommended for eating. Um, there are some highly toxic species, but then additionally, it's, it's just in general people, uh, you know, steer clear of Cortinarius. So um, I want to show you a polypore. This is not in the best shape I've ever seen. Okay, so it's in really crummy shape. This is Ganoderma curtisi, also known as the uh, golden reishi mushroom. It is very, very common in North Carolina. It grows uh, as a uh, decomposer of oak. And so you'll find it at the bases of oaks. You'll find it actually here is a, a pretty good specimen. So it's doing some, uh, you know, uh, basically invasive action on, on this uh, oak tree right here. And so what you have with mushrooms like this is a, uh, you know, a fruiting body that doesn't necessarily have to be woody. Like the case of Ganoderma curtisi and other reishi type mushrooms is they are, uh, you know, kind of woody on, uh, and corky when they're uh, fresh. But underneath, you'll see they have a porous layer and a porous undersurface. And that's where the spores come from. 
So you have uh, fleshy polypores, but you also have a lot of them, like uh, Ganoderma curtisi, that grow as uh, sort of woody conchs at the base of or up in trees. Uh, Ganoderma curtisi is really easy to identify insofar as it you know, has this sort of reddish varnish color. When it is younger, it often has a lot of really beautiful uh, sort of golden uh, colors around the, these outer uh, growth zones. Uh, but, you know, as, as you can see, it is a little bit on the old side. That said, you often get this sort of like uh, patina of sort of a whiter coloration on top of the mushroom as it starts to, or at, this has probably been around for weeks. It's pretty dried out. Uh, so that is how to identify your uh, reishi mushroom. I think the part that I like the most about finding Ganoderma curtisi and other, uh, well, actually curtisi in particular, it often comes up in this, uh, you know, adorable sort of uh, Starship Enterprise looking deal. And so I really enjoy seeing them and finding them for that reason. Uh, but when they are fresh, this undersurface is white. And uh, so that's, that's helpful to know. All right, so I'm gonna talk about our uh, parchment fungus real quick. This is a sterium uh, mushroom. A year ago, I would have said confidently, this is Sterium austria and just moved on. Uh, I understand that the uh, Sterium genus is undergoing some changes and I'm just not ready to process that yet. I'm not as into uh, parchment fungi, fungi as some. Uh, but what you have is, again, what you would call a parchment fungus. So from the top, it looks a lot like a common and popular mushroom uh, that people call turkey tail. So Tremedes versicolor. Uh, but when you look underneath, it has got a completely smooth surface. And so unlike polypores, parchment fungi, uh, you know, really take after their common name as far as being a little bit brittle, but they don't break apart very easily and they're smooth underneath. They'd be lovely to write teeny tiny mouse sized ransom notes on or something like that. Uh, but uh, sterium in particular, and I, I was pronouncing it sterium, I think it's sterium but I constantly put the emphasis on the wrong syllable when it comes to, uh, you know, scientific names. So you should take all of my pronunciations with a grain of salt, but sterium, I think is uh, accurate in this case. But, uh, you know, these mushrooms very frequently will have these concentric growth zones. They can be uh, very green. They get a little algae on them. And, uh, you know, the main thing to be mindful of with these is that they're not harmful, but uh, some people who collect turkey tail and make tea out of them, uh, you know, want to be aware that uh, the parchment fungus is uh, something that looks like a turkey tail. It won't hurt you, but nonetheless, uh, it is not the real deal that you are seeking. And in uh, that vein, turkey tails, Tremedes versicolor, are uh, polypores. So, uh, in conclusion, I want to do something that I've been doing with increasing frequency, and hopefully I have good enough aim. Uh, these are red russula mushrooms. Red russula mushrooms are impossible to identify. They're a reminder of the uh, great mystery of the fungal world and how hard it is to master, uh, you know, field identification, certainly. And they explode extremely well when you throw them at things. Uh, so that's really what I like to conclude with, or at least I think I might be making a pattern of it. Red russulas are always abundant, uh, white and red capped, uh, you know, kind of straightforward mushrooms that explode and in this case actually uh, stick to the wall, which is fabulous. Last thing I want to say is uh, I have started making mushroom t-shirts that um, have my uh, mushroom drawings on them. So I do that when I'm bored or there are no uh, mushrooms out to find. If you're interested in taking a look, I have a site. It's called mushroomanna.com. Anyway, I hope you have a lovely rest of your mushroom season uh, and find lots of them and uh, find as much joy and intrigue in them as I do.